Welcome to my talk today on engineering secure SSH access for engineers. My name is Colin McAllister. I'm a software engineer at Garmin. Uh, my duties there are mainly to assist in developing the distros we use on our marine products. So for those that don't know, Garmin makes a very wide range of marine products, uh, going from chart plotters, which are you know the glass like multi-touch displays, um, to like radars, sonars. A lot of that runs on Linux, so it's really exciting to work there. Um, I've worked with Embedded Linux for about six years, um, fell in love with it in college while working as an intern, and have wanted to work on it ever since. Uh, whenever I can, I like trying to contribute back to open source. Uh, you'll see my name sometimes in patches on Open Embedded, Yocto, Meta Layers. Uh, it seems like it's cutting it out. Um, SW Update and HVAC. And so whenever I'm not Programming, you'll generally find me on a bicycle, uh, preferably not on pavement. Uh, so a bit of a disclaimer here before we get started. I'm not a dedicated cybersecurity professional. I'm a software developer. Um, cybersecurity is kind of my one of my side passions. Uh, and so at Garmin, I did a lot of work on SSH for marine products. And so that required a decent amount of uh, research there. And so I kind of wanted to take what I learned and share it back with the community. Um, we don't really, unfortunately, have enough time to really dive into the details of how every single SSH authentication method works today. So uh, really, I want to focus on discussing each of the methods and how they comparatively meet uh, the demands of Embed Linux. Um, lastly, just to say, explicitly say it, um, the views expressed within this presentation are those of mine, and they do not necessarily reflect the views of, views of Garmin. So. Um, why are we here today? Why am I talking about SSH authentication? Um, because security is really important. Um, we, I think we all really enjoyed Marta's talk yesterday talking about uh, you know, pretty serious issues with, that can happen whenever you uh, have security issues with embedded Linux products. You know, embedded devices often have a very physical presence. You know, they can be used in industrial, automotive, marine, medical, and potentially other areas. And so that can sometimes come with a possible direct impact on user safety. So, um, you know, even if you're not, you're not making products in a critical sector, uh, you know, conference room monitors or, or and like baby monitors, you know, we uh, all remember the stories back in the day about those being hacked um, when the first Wi-Fi uh, baby monitors came out. So, you know, we're all kind of aware security is important. Governments are really starting to step in and regulate that as well. Um, you see that in the EU radio equipment directive that's uh, coming down the pipeline for next year and the newly minted US cyber trust mark. So let's take a step back since this is a beginner presentation. I just wanted to you know, quickly explain what SSH is. SSH is the secure shell. Um, it's a protocol to be able to gain uh, secure connections and, and authenticate connections over potentially insecure networks. Um, so SSH is built on top of TCP IP, um, and it can be served as a foundation for a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I have with me a 700 page book on how to use SSH. Um, it's a pretty easy thing to work with initially, but I think the 700 pages speak for themselves on what you can do with it. Uh, so um, there's a couple other benefits too, as far as compression as well. Um, I'm sorry about the slides here. Uh, so SSH is a Swiss army knife for developers. Um, with it, you can gain remote shell access, tunneling, port forwarding, uh, be able to transfer files to and from devices, and even do things like X11 forwarding, um, if people still use X11. Uh, and so all that can be done over an encrypted and authenticated connection. So um, you know, with, with this, it's a really powerful option for developers to use um, with their devices. As far as authentication goes, uh, SSHD, the, the daemon that runs on the host, supports multiple ways for clients to authenticate. Um, authentication methods can be enabled, disabled, configured, all that within the SSHD configuration file, which is located in Etsy SSH. Um, you will need root level permissions to edit this file. Um, and it generally comes with default authentication configurations. So make sure you kind of know what those are uh, whenever you're, you're modifying those. So SSH with embedded devices. This is typically, from my perspective, how 
a lot of developers typically interact with uh, embedded devices. You know, a lot of times, like this device over here, um, it doesn't just come with a display. And so there's um, SSH gives a really great way to get a shell on the device, work on it, diagnose issues, develop, um, so on and so forth. Um, so in, you know, in this case, SSH devices are the uh, server we're talking about. Um, embedded Linux products may or may not have internet connectivity and correct system time. These are important things that we'll talk, we'll kind of continue to talk on um, as I go throughout the presentation. Um, one last thing to note is that software updates may be difficult or not guaranteed to be timely. Um, a lot of times it potentially requires users to install updates, which um, we know, we all know how much people love doing that. Um, so, what's the most secure solution? Just turn off SSH, right? You know, uh, on your release builds, you can just turn off SSH. Uh, the most secure door is a brick wall. So uh, this will eliminate any risk of third parties gaining access to uh, your device over SSH. So I guess we all go home, right? Um, I think that's not really a realistic solution for all of us. Uh, it may work for some people, um, but I think it limits the ability for your developers to interact with the builds that you're releasing to your customers and also prevents any sort of uh, field diagnostics or maintenance once your devices are deployed. So today we're gonna really be talking about secure authentication methods that work with deployed devices. So before we start diving into uh, authentication methods, let's kind of uh, go over some of the requirements, you know, to, as far as what I was using when I was evaluating which uh, products are good or bad. So a solution needs to be secure and limit access to only the approved individuals uh, that you want to give access to. We, we need the solution to scale. Um, you know, when you're talking about embedded devices, you're potentially talking about thousands of devices out in the field or even more than that. Um, so we, we need some way to be able to make a solution that works for every single one of those devices. Um, and then lastly, I think, you know, these may not apply to everyone, but I like to think about edge cases. So, uh, you know, authentication may be required without internet connectivity or correct system time. Um, I mean, even if you have internet connectivity or, sys or, or a system clock, I mean, what happens if your real-time clock battery dies on your board? Um, or what if the modem goes bad? If you send a, like a software engineer out to figure out what's wrong with your device, it's gonna be a huge pain if they can't authenticate and gain SSH access. So, um, yeah, so we'll start with the uh, first authentication method, um, password authentication. So this is the default authentication method. Um, anyone that's used SSH and didn't have a great uh, or an authentication method already put in place, you'll get prompted for a password. What password do you enter? It's the password for the user that you intend to SSH in as. So in my little example there on the right, I'm SSHing into myself on my own PC. And since I don't have uh, any other way to authenticate, it prompts me for a password. So for embedded passwords or passwords on embedded Linux, there's really two ways we can think about this. We could do one shared password used across all devices, or we can configure each device with a unique password. The uh, shared password across all devices is probably the easiest. You can bake it into your firmware and it's update, updatable within your firmware updates. Um, but if you have that password for some reason compromised, if someone in the field cracks it or um, some developer walks away with it, all your devices are compromised. Not really an ideal solution for uh, unique passwords, this gives you a lot more granularity where one password will only compromise one device, but I think that's a huge burden to maintain. You know, uh, you'll need some sort of database that stores all the passwords. Let's say you make a unique password for, or unique random password for each of your devices, or maybe you can create some sort of password derivation function that takes publicly available information like the, you know, unit serial ID or uh, the MAC address and hashes that into a password. Um, how do you keep that password function secret? Um, I assume if you wrote that code, it would get stored in version control. It's probably about as good as storing your passwords in version control. So not really an ideal solution there either. Um, and so ultimately, like beyond that, I mean, you'll need some sort of way to 
be able to pull passwords down if they're stored in a database as well, which gets into our problem with internet connectivity. Um, if some, some developers on the field trying to gain access to a device. Um, and it's also just not, this isn't a really great way to automate authentication. Um, there's really no built-in way to automatically enter a password with SSH. Um, there's some tooling available, but uh, I just wouldn't mess with it. So all that's to say, let's not use password authentication. Um, passwords can be cracked and that can leave one or more of your devices compromised. Um, we're actually starting to see regulation now that's also uh, this, or prevent, you know, regulating people to not use globally shared passwords on their embedded IoT devices. So uh, I wouldn't recommend using that. Um, and then, so unique passwords are better, but I think they add way more complexity than they do security. It's just, I don't think it's a, a real great option there. And lastly, it's just hard to keep these password secrets and, secret and um, automate password entry. Okay, so what's the next authentication method? I mean, as we kind of talk through these, I think to me it kind of follows my path on, on these authentication methods as I learn them um, you know, throughout my career. Public key authentication is a great one. Um, it's generally what I think most people will do when they get tired of entering their password every time they use SSH. Um, so with this method, it's, it's a challenge response uh, mechanism that's automated. So a server will send a client a uh, challenge and then the client will uh, generate a response with their private key, which the server will then verify with a copy of the public key that's stored on the host device. Um, tr trusted public keys are stored in a text database file within the .ssh directory in the user's home directory that you're trying to SSH in as. With public key authentication, um, generally private keys will be harder to crack versus passwords, um, unless you make really long, complicated passwords. Uh, that that rule will stay true. Um, but you know, SSH users will need file system access to the private key that they use. Um, that private key file is subject to exfiltration. You know, a disgruntled employee could walk away with it. Um, it could be left on a thumb drive that some developer leaves. You know out in the field when they're doing diagnostics work, it's easy to lose files. So, and especially when people are carrying them around and um, not necessarily storing them in a secure manner. Um, and so then we also dive back into the same exact problem we had was pass, pass, password authentication where it suffers the same shared versus unique problem. Do you trust all of your, or are you willing to risk all your devices using the same key pair? and only have to worry about your developers using a single key? Um, or do you want to create some sort of database that stores a unique key pair for every single device that you um, create? Don't really like either of those. So I would also recommend against using public key authentication. Um, although it can be more secure than passwords and is more automatable, um, it suffers the same exact issues as passwords. Um, so. Um, So now we'll start talking about some of the more uh, stronger authentication me methods that are built, built into OpenSSH. So the first one is GSS API, or most people know it as Kerberos, which is the most popular implementation of that protocol. Um, this is a much more complex authentication mechanism than the previous two methods we just talked about, um, and involves several uh, correspondences with where a client will first talk to an authentication server and then take a uh, ticket from that device and uh, pass it to the ticket granting service, um, which will then give the ultimate uh, secrets that you need to authenticate with your intended device. So uh, with this method, it's, it's pretty well built because uh, it, it all, relies on symmetric keys between all your devices. And also it supports scaling pretty well. Um, anyone that's familiar with Active Directory and LDAP, um, that's basically uh, Microsoft's implementation of Kerberos. And um, you know when we're talking about that being used in enterprise context with many devices, that kind of shows that this could be potentially used um, in an embedded context as well. But I think it's somewhat 
tricky to use in an embedded context. Um, all devices and infrastructure require accurate time for this to work because tickets uh, used in Kerberos are very time-based. Um, and it also kind of touches on the same issues we talked about with password and keys, where it's, it's difficult to manage unique keys for all your devices, especially on the edge where internet connectivity may be spotty or, or not available at all. Um, so while this is a strong authentication method, I don't think um, it's very easy to implement for embedded use cases. Um, if someone can prove me wrong, I would love to hear it. Uh, feel free to contact me. Um, it would be really interesting to see if this works. But uh, today, what I really want to talk the most about is what I think is the strongest form of authentication, which is certificate-based authentication. Um, so this is fairly similar to public-private key authentication. Um, but the, it, instead of the device trusting the private, public-private key pair of the user, it is uh, it, it ultimately trusts a certificate authority, uh, and so whenever a, a client has their own key pair, they can sign their public key with the certificate authority certificate authority's uh, key pair, which will then generate a signed public key or certificate. Um, it's basically the same same thing, uh, and then use that when when authenticating. So. Uh, the, uh, whenever a, a, a user uh, uses a private key that contains a certificate with it, the host will verify the authentic authenticity of that, the, the certificate with both the CA's public key that's stored on, on the device and also the client's um, public private key there. Sorry for the technical difficulty, folks. Um, okay. So, we kind of talked a little bit about how certificate-based authentication works. Let's talk about the SSH certificate itself, or signed public key. So this is a certificate format that's, um, that, that was specified within OpenSSH. If you go into open, the OpenSSH source code, there's a protocol.cert keys file that specifies this, this format. Um, so essentially, it's a signed public key with some extra options. You have a validity period, like most other certificates, that specifies when the certificate is valid. You have critical options, which is a unique feature. Um, and so these features restrict act, are control features that restrict access. So the, the three that are kind of built in right now is force command, source address, and verify required. Force command is really cool. I think it has a lot of... Uh, really cool use cases where you can specify a command that will be the only command that the certificate can run if authentication um, happens. So um, potentially if you have someone out in the field that you don't really trust to give them full SSH access, but you want them to just print out a log or give you some other diagnostic information, you could just specify what command you want to run with, with force command. And then when they try to SSH with that certificate, it'll just run that command and immediately exit. So pretty cool option there. Uh, source address just limits what addresses can be, clients can use uh, when they're using the certificate. Uh, you can just specify a CIDR block within the certificate with that critical option. And then verify required, that's one that has to do with the biometric uh, keys that are now used. I've never really used it, so I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, but there's also extensions, and so that these enable features once access is granted, so uh, these deal with like being able to permit X11 forwarding, uh, port forwarding, a bunch of other features. Uh, the PTY one is, is useful if you are using something like force command and you can turn that off so you can guarantee there's absolutely no way shell access will be granted with that certificate. Um, and so there's a couple other ones too. Uh, they're just kind of metadata items like there's key ID, which is a great way to audit what certificates are being used on your devices because that'll show up in the device's logs. Um, a serial number for the certificate, and then uh, principles is an important one. So uh, because the certificate authority is globally configured in SSHD, it will, certificates will essentially work for any user on that 
host device. Uh, so you have to specify what users a certificate is valid for. So like in this example on the right, uh, the only principal is Colin. So that's the only user I can SSH in as with this certificate. So um, as far as the demo of just kind of showing how this works, like on a local PC, you can demonstrate this auth authentication flow fairly easily. So we'll need two key pairs before we uh, proceed. So we'll first generate the certificate authority key pair and the client's key pair. These can be uh, whatever format you want. Um, and so then once we have those created, we need to add the CA's public key to the authorized, um, or to the SSHD config file. So um, trusted user CA keys is the option you wanna specify, and then you spe specify a path to the public key on the, that host device. Um, you can generally just throw those keys into Etsy SSH. Um, and so once that's done and you reload SSHD, you should be good to go. The, the SSHD will now trust your, your certificate authority. So we need to get a certificate next. So SSH keygen will uh, do this for you. Um, in a more actual app, like deployment-based application, you probably wanna do this within some sort of signing server, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. Um, but this kind of helps demonstrate some of the options that you want to add whenever you're gaining a certificate. So the first option with that keygen command is specifying what certificate authority private key you want to use. Uh, the next option is the uh, identifier you want to add. So like I was saying with auditing, you probably want to specify maybe the developer's name um, or their username um, within that identifier. And then next we'll specify principles. Um, so since this is an embed device, we'll just go ahead and give them root, uh, root for the principal and make it valid for one day. And then, so lastly, we'll specify the public key of the, um, that we want to sign with the certificate, or the certificate authority. So once we have that, uh, you'll now have a certificate file um, in the same directory. So SSH is kind of picky with how certificates are named. So you'll see a, after this operation, you'd see a client ID, ECDSA, uh, hyphen cert.pub file, so that's your certificate. Um, SSH, is the, the client is also configured to look for a key or a certificate file with that naming format when you specify a key to use um, when calling SSH. So for this last option where we actually call SSH, uh, you specify that you wanna use the client ID ECDSA uh, key and it will find the associated certificate there and use that to be able to SSH into your uh, device. So with all that kind of said and talking about how certificates work uh, in principle, let's talk about embedded use cases. So as I was kind of saying previously in this presentation, time may not be reliable on your devices. If you have a system clock that's off and outside the bounds of uh, your Bloody period, your certificate will fail um, to allow to authenticate you. So it's not that hard to patch OpenSSH to disable the validity period checking. Um, I've included the lines from sshkey.c where that validity period is checked. So if you just comment out those lines, uh, the validity period is no longer checked for certificates. Um, for those kind of paying or playing along, uh, you'll probably think, wow, now certificates are really powerful because if you uh, disable this, then a certificate will now and forever always be valid. So it really leaves the solution no better than public key authentication. It may be even worse because you're now distributing a whole bunch of uh, certificates and key pairs that uh, will allow you to SSH into every single device. So there's a way to fix this. We can, with the uh, cert keys protocol in OpenSSH, it, oh, specifies how developers can create their own critical options. So let's assume we have devices where we have a unique identifier built into the host name or in some other way, we could be able to create a new cert critical option that specifies what unique identifier you want to authenticate with. So what we can get, do is be able to bind certificates to a single target device that you can SSH into. Um, so for this example, uh, I created a critical option called hostname at company.com. Um, the at company.com is because inside the uh, protocol, it states that you should always add your company's domain to uh, any critical options that you decide to create. So 
we can patch SSHD to only accept certificates when the device identity matches what's specified in the critical option. So instead of binding certificates over a time-based domain, we are now binding certificates over a device identity domain. Um, this could be used with or without validity period checking. Um, if you were able to leave validity period checking enabled, you now have very uh, tight access control with certificates, where it's, a certificate is only valid for a certain period of time on a uh, specific device. Um, but if validity period is not possible on your, your, for your application, a uh, certificate now has some sort of granularity that I think makes it better than any of the other options we've talked about so far. So how complicated is it to add a new critical option? Not too bad. Um, so right here is the uh, lines of code I wrote and added to um, OpenSSH to uh, test out this idea of using the hostname at company.com. Um, it just requires basically an extra case inside authoptions.c where it's checking the critical options of the certificate. Um, so with that, all we have to do is just add an extra line to our SSH keygen command where we specify what critical option we want to use inside the certificate. So right here, I added my device 123 as the, the device that I want to uh, um, or use, include in, for my, my new critical option. So now my certificate will only authenticate with my device 123.local. Um, so one, one really important thing to stress here is if you did something like this, uh, if you do omit that critical option, it, a certificate's still going to work like on every single device because that critical option won't be used. So you'll need to have your signing server enforce the use of that critical option where every certificate contains that critical option. Otherwise, you, your signing server will be creating um, certificates that work on every single device. So um, all in all, let's summarize here with certificates. It's, pretty, it's really easy to configure your host to uh, trust a single certificate authority's public key. Um, if you ever need to roll that due to some issue, you could do that in a firmware update very easily. So we get basically that, that same ease when we're talking about uh, doing a common uh, public private key pair or a common password that's shared on all your devices. Um, but the, the real strong strength of security here is we can lock away that certificate authority's private key and put it hopefully in like an HSM or some sort of security token in a server, in a locked room, um, in the middle of your corporate office, uh, behind a firewall. And so uh, that way there's really the most minimal risk that this key could ever become compromised. Um, besides that, you can also push authentication to uh, that signing step. So uh, developers can use like LDAP credentials to authenticate with the uh, cert certificate authority signing server. And um, that way you're then also auditing uh, each signing operation where you know what users are asking for what certificates. Um, you guys don't have to go design this yourself. Uh, there's several implementations that already are, exist out there for uh, SSH certificate authorities. Um, HashiCorp Vault's one that I'm very familiar with and would definitely recommend. Um, I also know Small Steps SSH platform seems pretty good. They were the, honestly, the, uh, their, one of their white papers on using SSH certificates was what uh, convinced me to uh, look at the, explore this option a long time ago. Um, so certificates can be very short-lived if you can guarantee time. So that's a really awesome uh, perk here. So you know, for uh, use cases where validity periods can be used, you can give certificates like a one-day certificate. So every morning they log in and get a certificate and they can use that for development. And then when they come in the next day, um, they just have to get a new one. Um, pretty, pretty easy there. Uh, the critical options and extensions can add a lot of flexibility and features um, that, I mean, don't exist with any of these other authentication method, methods that we talked about. Um, and it's not very hard to alter OpenSSH to uh, work around potential embedded requirements that you have um, to make certificates work. So one other thing too is besides client certificates, which is all we've been talking about today, there's also host certificates for SSH, which is basically the same thing, except it's the, ho the host private keys are uh, 
the host public keys are, are signed with certificates as well. Um, if anyone's familiar with SSH and how you'll initially be prompted to trust a public key for a device you're SSHing into for the first time, um, in, in the industry we call that tofu or trust on first use and is one of the easiest ways for like a man in the middle attack to happen. So uh, if you create host-based certificates or host certificates for your devices, that prov provides a method for you to avoid that where your clients can be configured to uh, trust the certificate authority in their known host file and that allows uh, your, your clients to seamlessly authenticate without having to do that prompt and um, worry about man the middle attacks. So um, if none of these solutions today seem like they worked for your use cases, that's totally fine. Um, the one other thing I want to talk about is PAM. So PAM stands for Pluggable Authentication Mo Module. It's another uh, utility that it, within Linux that allows uh, for you to use uh, PAM, authentica PAM authentication modules, which um, a lot of them exist out there like OAuth 2.0, Google Authenticator, YubiKey, um, and so you can specify within your PAM configuration files what you want SSHD to use, and then you can configure SSHD to use PAM authentication. So this is kind of the Wild West, and if any of you want to go out on your own adventure and uh, explore some options there, uh, feel free to do that. So um, with that, I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, you can also reach out to me on GitHub or LinkedIn. Um, and then lastly, I have a page of references for people to check out um, related to the information I shared on this presentation. Are you are you using certificate revocation lists like to? Uh, I know some devices don't have internet connectivity all the time, but maybe a way to sync downstream CRL to revoke the certificates. Let's say you have a certificate and that developer is not in the company anymore. You want to revoke? Do you have a way to do that? Um. I, that I think there is work ongoing if it's not recently done to add like CRLs for SSA certificates. It's been something that historically hasn't been supported because um, like with X509 certificates or any of these other ones that have CRLs, um, we're generally talking about like several year long certificates, right, for your website um, where if, yeah, you have a compromise issue, you can thro throw out something you want to add to your CRL. Um, because SSA certificates are so short-lived, and that's how they've always been advocated to be short-lived, um, the, the, I don't think anyone's done the work to add a CRL, but I, I swear I saw a patch not too long ago um, uh, that was adding the possibility of a CRL for SSA certificates, but I don't know much more than that. Thank you. So what would be kind of cool is if um, if the SSH daemon would be able to um, interrogate the NTP uh, client to find out whether it's synchronized and then fall back to the critical, um, what was it? Critical options. Critical option. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, the, the time issue is something that I, I've been wanting to do more work on. Like, I think one of the challenges that I spent a lot of time thinking about was, it's like, okay, you have a device that has incorrect system time. Um, you know, how, how does that device get updated? Like, if, what's, I mean, because, like, I think about from my, my applications, right? We have boats that um, have GPS on them. So they should always be able to get time, correct time, but what happens if that's like in a garage, right? And so to me, you know, NTP is obviously a solution there um, in some way that you could have NTP 
packets into it. Um, for those that are familiar with NTP, there's no way in the default implementation for authenticity of those time packets to be verified. So that creates a challenge. Um, but there are new emerging standards on time sharing um, that provide authentication. So you know, one of the ideas I had was like, what if you had some sort of you know hardware token I could plug in my device as a software engineer going out in the field that is able to provide you know secure authenticated time to a device um, to get it updated, and then you could use validity periods. Um, there, there's some ideas there. I honestly haven't had the time to really like that engineer some, some sort of solution there, but maybe uh, in a couple of years, I'll give a presentation on that. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> so if we, if we go with certificate-based authentication, uh, what's needed to be done uh, on our side as a company to prepare the image so that in a case something goes wrong, for example, and we need to get from the customer some logs, and we have, let's say, five different customers, do you have to then prepare, like, image, each, so custom image tailored, tailored for a customer or not? And what's needed then, uh, how, how would this look like in a real life? Do we, yeah, I mean, that's the easy answer is that's ultimately up to you. Uh, but to kind of explain out a potential use case, like if you have five different customers, right, you may want five different certificate authorities, one for each of your different customers. So but there's that isolation. makes my life as a developer, yeah, difficult. That means five different images, you know, built. And right. then in production, they would have to flash five different Im images per customer. That's, but, that's a no-go, let's, let's say. But if, if that's the case, then just why not just use one certificate authority for all those, all those customers, right? Okay. And then they say we have a problem, and we say, okay, send us the logs. What do we need to do? we have to send them? Uh, how, how would that, that then work? Um, so for internal use cases, you could have your developers just directly query the signing server to sign their keys. Um, if it's someone that's outside of your company, yeah. um, what you can do or what I would do would be to create a custom key pair that's not used for anything else, generate a certificate for it. If you just need logs from the device, use that force command option to specify a command to query the logs like you want and then zip all that up together or tarball it and s ship it off to them with an instructions on how to use SSH. And I mean, as I kind of was, showing back in the original demo. I mean, ultimately, oops, went too far, sorry. Uh, all you have to do is just have them run, you know, extract your compressed set of files and then just run SSH with that command. Force command will run automatically. So, I mean, if you run this command with force command, the logs will be printed out. You get the logs from whoever runs the command and that would, that's all you would need. And how would this, if the time is not correct on the device with a, with a, if we say you have a, a certificate which is valid for one day, well then how this is, how this works if, if, if the time is wrong on the device? Yeah, then that's, that's the challenge with certificates. Um, if, if that is, uh, I mean, you can either try to create a certificate that is wide enough in a validity period that it should capture the system clock being off. Or if you know you want to account for that edge case, disable validity period in SSHD on your device, and then just make sure before you send them the information, you get some sort of device identifier of what device they're trying to get into and use a critical option to specify that certificate can, can only be used with that singular device. Okay, um, thanks. Periods? So the, the question is, can you have different CAs with different validity periods? Yes. Um, so I've primarily worked with HashiCorp Vault for uh, SSH certificate authority, and it's really easy to set up, you know, multiple SSH uh, certificate authority like engines within it. 
And all, each of those can be individually tailored. So you can have, you know, maybe your trusted developers will get a one day certificate, but you know, your field software engineer that's just debugging something out in the field gets 15 minutes to make that very short lived, very minimal. Um, and so you would just potentially, I mean, you can actually, even for the same uh, certificate authority key pair, like in Vault, you can specify like different roles. And even with LDAP, be able to specify what roles what users can use. So, I mean, that's the thing is like, you're really pushing all of that like uh, authentication and like access control to the cloud with like Vault, um, where it's really easy to do that. And then all your devices have to do is just trust a certificate authority's um, public key, and that's, that's all you have to do on the device. I think, oh, one more question, then I think we're out of time. Oh, uh, sorry, he was first. Two, two questions. <laughs> uh, there were the two patches that you said for OpenSSH. Yeah. Uh, have you tried to send those upstream, or would those be, no, those are security? <laughs> like, yes. I imagine a compile time option to disable time might be a, I, a path. path I think center. that's one that will probably never be upstreamed. I, okay. I would really like for it to be like a compile time option, but I would have a hard time believing that the maintainers would ever accept it. We did try pushing the host name or uh, variant of the host name critical option upstream, and we're told by the OpenSSH maintainers that it was too niche of a use case hmm. um, for them to accept it. Uh, so for both of those patches, I have those on GitHub. That's what those links go to. Um, it's on my OpenSSH fork on my GitHub, you feel free to look at it. I honestly feel like there's, you know, if enough people ask for it and we find a solution that kind of works for everyone, the maintainers will kind of hopefully accept it at some point. But it was one of those things where we tried, failed, and then decided it's something we're okay accepting, um, you know, to implement ourselves, so. This probably reduces the attack surface of those password bots, which hit uh, devices on networks. Are you using any other things like fail to ban to try to limit those um, botnets and stuff? Yeah. Um, so are you talking about with the, the signing server or with your edge devices? Uh, the edge devices. Um, yeah, I mean, that's. I think that's, if not one of the most biggest reasons not to use the password or public private key authentication is because as we have IoT devices now that are internet connected, I mean, I've seen plenty of DEF CON talks where it's like, hey, we found a bad auth uh, problem with authentication for a device. Um, let's use Shodan to figure out how many devices there are that are internet connected. And then that becomes very scary. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I think that's kind of the root of like with Certificate authorities, as long, I mean, if you use a, a really good, you know, let's say RSA 4096 key in your certificate authority, that hopefully is something that, as long as it never leaves your, your company's IP, should never be compromised, um, you know, fingers crossed, and um, leave your authentication method much more secure than something that could potentially be brute force attacked through some sort of botnet, right? So. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, I appreciate everyone showing up. <laughs>